Hello everyone, today we talk about walls breaching in medieval siege warfare and this is gonna be a bit of an introductory video, we will talk a lot about things like trebuchet and mangonels and stuff like that, but we will also take into uh, account the broader dimension of this uh, objective of walls breaching, so also considering um, not even the breaching proper, but also sometimes the simple assault, how it was carried out or how walls were made collapse uh, in other ways through tunneling and other stuff like that and I will make other dedicated videos on trebuchet uh, on mangonels and all so I'm not gonna stop it here today it's just to talk in broader terms about um, actually high medieval siege warfare here we're gonna go essentially from the Viking era until until roughly the beginning of 14th century, so it's going to be very also back and forth uh, depending on the sources that we're gonna uh, quote. So the um, I would like to start talking um, with the uh, the general material dimension of siege warfare because. Um, we often give for granted how really much um, gunpowder, uh, even though it took a, a lot of time to develop effectively, really changed the nature of warfare, even up to our day. I mean, not just in walls breaching, but really how also in the dimensions of warfare, the spatial dimensions of warfare, um, the uh, physical dimension, broader speaking, so not just uh, speed or space, um, say, but also um the the actual energy that was employed all the forces um the strengths that were uh, involved into this and many people get this wrong as if you know medieval warfare was a sort of backwards uh, uh art of of warfare actually and especially siege warfare is seen like oh well uh, just a small castle was enough to bog down an army trying to uh, to 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 capture it by besieging it and all, but telling the truth, um, medieval warfare and I've been I haven't really been talking about this much, but I think it's very important uh, to is really about tearing down these stereotypes because it's actually wrong to conceive um, medieval warfare in such a fashion. Um, medieval warfare was extremely sophisticated, and this is what people are not really that willing to to acknowledge most of the times. Um, because they, I don't know, either they prefer for some cultural reason to, to think of the Middle Ages as a dark hole where nothing interested was created. As a matter of fact, especially siege warfare that was in this sense one of the most important because of the, um, as we've seen here, of the technological potential that made castles really pretty effective bulwarks at this time, was extremely um, complex, was extremely refined. Um, the Middle Ages have been really the uh, civilization of the machines. Mm. Uh, it's incredible what the medievals actually accomplished with the um, means at their disposal. Um, and uh, what is unfortunate, and I've discussed this um, recently in part, at least I just hinted it at it into the video I made about medieval uh, technology now, is um, is really the, um, um, the the amount of inventive that was present in in medieval engineers and all, and the problem that we have um, is really the um, the, the uh, a strictly historical problem that is essentially that we don't often uh, have access to. Um, that practical knowledge that at the time, however, was um, extremely um, was something especially uh, handed down orally speaking was wasn't written down. So that sometimes we start knowing about this only very late in time. Mm. People often get confused and mistaken by saying, oh, "Okay, since this uh, I don't know this machinery or this particular technology appears for the first time in a manuscript that I can objectively." Uh, see and study about um, uh, well that's when what where that technology began actually this is false 
there was um, a submerged uh, um, amount uh, of of knowledge of skills of crafts that quite often we can't really track but it was uh, from the hints that we have at our disposal we know it was actually huge mm -hmm. um, in that video medieval technology was discussing for instance how um, the westerners were increasingly more interested into uh, getting books from the east from the byzantine and the uh, islamic world to actually learn about ancient knowledge about things however that they were already doing so it wasn't really about learning how to do that which probably they already knew how to do it uh, already better in some ways because than, than the ancients because we'll see how trebuchet were actually much more effective than um, ancient siege uh, machinery but also in here there is not really a matter of superiority or inferiority it was simply a different context that required different solutions and in that sense um, a medieval engineer of 12th century might have been interested in reading about um, ancient polyarsetics but uh, already knowing lots of other things more to that that eventually uh, combined could have uh, achieved uh, much greater results and and what you see is especially that from theory to practice things vary a lot mm. and since we are mostly stuck to written sources we tend to attribute a much greater importance to theory and and ignoring practice as if that was something lower or less you know smart to do or less intelligent and as a matter of fact it's uh, the other way around because practical solutions require actually a much greater deal of intelligence and only after you have reached them uh, you are historically willing to to write that down to hand it to other people that might not might have not passed through the difficulties you have done but that in this sense can replicate them um, can replicate those technologies uh, in a much uh, quicker way so this is very important to understand actually medieval technology um, and we, we shouldn't uh, actually think that this pretty apparently brutal and rough and very physical way sometimes medieval warfare was about was actually something primitive or uh, inferior mm. on the contrary so there were actually uh, many ways, really many different ways into, wi into which in medieval times you could, before firearms, you could effectively break, uh, break through and, sh and shake or simply, I don't know, create a, um, uh, another form of, uh, of, of breach that was uh, of crack, of fissure, let's say into the um, into the enemy walls um, what is interesting from this point of view is also that firearms when they appeared uh, really didn't wipe out um, the other form of artillery that existed before as a matter of fact trebuchet kept existing for 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 a couple of centuries still and um, the um, the same firearms at the beginning weren't really uh, something extremely refined. Um, they may be, in terms of cost benefits, were also inferior compared, uh, or better say, le less convenient than um, than the other uh, siege artillery existing in there. Um, the um, so the. Th there were many instruments. Sometimes there were simple, um, uh, uh, very simple physical, um, mm, you know, uh, mm, mm, actions uh, actually uh, being used, like using um, a leverage of some sort just to make pressure on the wall to, to and trying to, to tear it down. By the way. Consider in this sense that medieval um, fortifications have undergone a pretty, mm, pretty substantial transformation throughout, throughout the medieval, medieval times, especially in the lower Middle Ages. And even today, we're not going to talk about medieval engineering in terms of uh, fortifications, but that was also ex something extremely refined. It required certain uh, skills were actually amazing sometimes we don't really know how even they made it to build certain things um, but they did so evidently for them <laughs> uh, um, 
and also on a large scale. So even if for them it wasn't so uh, difficult as uh, w it would be actually for, for us to do the same thing. This is something you, you find incredibly that we look at things from the past, you know, constructions, buildings from the ancient of the medieval world, and we say, how the heck did these guys made it, made it to, to make it to, to build this? Because um, evidently we live in a world that has solved a lot of problems thanks to technology, but uh, that in this sense has lost also a lot of inventive, of mental flexibility sometimes. So what seems to us an impossible enterprise today, well, those guys you made it, they, they made it, um, uh, I mean, not impossible today, but today f w with their means, okay? So th those guys, they made it, um, and they made it also well, mm, so that you can still see certain of those masterpieces uh, standing out there. So leverages were used, uh, iron bars, uh, battle rams, um, the, um, the other mm, major, say, uh, and more, uh, let's say, the, the small, uh, mm, simple uh, siege equipment uh, that existed since the ancient age was the, uh, in fact, the, the battle ram, um, also called um, matton. Um, because there is also this problem in mm, medieval history that um, there wasn't really a scientific categories into which such such um, siege equipment could practically fit. Uh, and this is valid also for the ancient world. Literally. We we read a name from the sources and we really d do not know what it really means because every place maybe this happened especially during the Middle Ages, was calling um, uh, certain, maybe what were materially and conceptually the same thing, also with different names. Mm -hmm. But also in here, the, the, the conceptualization was pl pretty blurry, mm -hmm. especially in size. This happened uh, also when uh, the siege, uh, excuse me, when artillery was being um, developed. Uh, I made a video about uh, late medieval art artillery into which I discuss um, the, um, um, the the actual mm, difficulties that we have in classifying artilleries fr uh, from especially th the very beginning and how these the categories didn't really uh, were already probably in part attached to a certain functionality of the weapon in terms especially of shape and characteristics and uh, material characteristics but that was you know varying in size so that you had names of what later would have become cannons actually that at the beginning were something that could vary from uh, uh, actually a, a handgun to a, uh, to a to a cannon let's say so uh, this is a bit also the case of, of, of the Middle Ages and as I was saying at the beginning it was also a lot of variety uh, in 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 size and in types of siege equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, also because really this could be influenced by the terrain, by the environment, by the kind of fortress you had to storm. So uh, medieval engineer engineers in this sense invented really a lot of new things at every time. So we were interested in this practical solution to, to achieve the, the desired uh, 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 objective. So the um, the so here battering rams were called also uh, matins in, in Latin they were called uh, arietes um, in plural uh, arias in, in, in the singular it's, it's like the, the zodiac signs animal you know the arias that punches with his head um, in Occitan uh, bosson mm. by the way in medieval history there were um, especially in the west and this was exported say that the, the most advanced countries in um, siege equipment at this time were uh, Italy and Germany uh, excuse me Italy and France um, Germany wasn't uh, as a matter of fact and um, 
the um, not that I mean we're so backwards, but it's an area where you know this uh, fallout coming from said France and Germany. Uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm miss <laughs> messing up everything here. From France and Italy uh, was coming, and this produced, in terms of uh, ling in linguistical terms, um, certain names actually um, being borrowed from other from other lands, mm -hmm. so that even the um, the word the um, the adaptations, the transliterations of certain names that were evidently either French chiefly French. Here, in fact, we see battering rams were called Bosson in, in Occitan, by the way. Um, not in, in, in Northern French. This is also interesting because it tells you how Occitania was pretty much advanced at the time, especially previously previously to, um, to the uh, French invasion of the North, where there were still, you know, uh, in kind of an independent powers from the French crown and there were areas of southern France that had an old uh, urbanization since Ro Roman times so they were rich so they could invest in this siege warfare with more sophisticated material this is a bit the case of northern Italy as well um, and it was actually pioneering um, especially um, these uh, missile uh, weapons uh, in terms of trebuchet but also of um, crossbows and also the um, there was a, a technological fallout into Europe that came from these areas and um, as for other things uh, for other phenomena actually it was this um, the, the the expansion of of these um, uh, technologies actually went in parallel with the expansion of feudalism for the simple reason that feudalism it did imply such uh, a territorial organization that involved castles mm -hmm. so castles so large as they were built say in France it's, it's something you couldn't see er elsewhere for some time then eventually feudalism starts expanding also in those regions and castles start being built more consistent uh, fortresses in this sense start being built and therefore you need a uh, a siege equipment that is uh, that allows you to uh, to uh, storm those fortresses. Um, um, this is important because people like to trace a sort of cause and effect relation between you know was it the trebuchets were were introduced because um, castles were stronger was it mm, trebucheted obliged castles to, to grow stronger because they were more effective against the one that existed before. Um, it's actually both at the same time. If you really look how it, it went, um, the technological development of this siege artillery actually went in, in parallel with the one of the fortresses. So it was a bit um, of a, of a um, you know, the, the two faces of the same metal let's say and the um, w what in turn however this triggered from a political and social point of view is that mm, trebuchet seemingly um, now were destroying effectively the older uh, castles so this implied that the strategical dynamism was greater because what stopped you before in terms of being uh, of a little fortress now could be wiped out in much lesser time uh, and this made uh, armies to be uh, speedier so this made threats especially of invasion greater um, so this in turn seemingly uh, triggered in part as a factor the development of national monarchies because just like a bit how it would have happened in a much greater um, um, scale uh, during the modern age with the states um, trying to centralize because they needed to build uh, greater castles and or more sophisticated fortifications at least. At least I made a video about tra Trace Italienne for instance that talks will deals with that and especially casting cannons so something that was much more expensive than before well this brought to a uh, political centralization. Well, so the trebuchet seemingly so that feudalism was in part even ended by these technologies because um, it obliged basically even the same lords with their own castles to seek the, prote the protection of their own monarchs 
because the enemies were growing with this increasingly sophisticated and effective uh, siege uh, machinery that would have wiped their uh, their smaller castles out. Um, so the um, uh, so we've seen battering rams and other more uh, simple ways, iron bars even to to break into the enemy gates or walls, etc. This was an naturally something very easy to do especially with moat and bailey castles where um, uh, castles were made up in, in timber and in dirt and s something like that and up to that time it wasn't it, it was totally inconvenient to use a sophisticated uh, torsion um, uh, engines like the ones of the ancient era so one of the reasons by the way why um, um, siege artillery uh, had uh, in great uh, siege tier technology, let's say, had in great part been lost as knowledge during the early Middle Ages. Wasn't that people all of a sudden became stupid? It's simply that society didn't require that that those technologies anymore. You know, what's the point of having a catapult to besiege a moat? Uh, that's something you can storm pretty easily. You can even tear the palisades down with an hatchet. So um, it's some, it was something inconvenient. Mm -hmm. So it was not a real decline. It was re a readaptation to new um, political and social contexts. So in fact, this um, new uh, medieval siege, uh, say new, uh, this siege technology was revived um, during the the high and lower Middle Ages when uh, society came to be uh, more complex and actually more dynamic because. Uh, Actually, uh, I mean, Europe, at least from certain centuries, became something much greater, more complex as a system than what, say, the ancient world uh, had been, um, at least by certain standards. And this, therefore, required, I mean, I think, uh, you know, uh, ancient the ancient world didn't have such an amount of fortified centers like medieval Europe. Hmm? They, they definitely had large cities with solid walls and all, but the rest of, especially in Europe, uh, it wasn't a big deal of that. It was mostly the Romans, actually, that created such fortifications. The, you know, the, we, the best you had were these Celtic opida that were pretty modest, uh, actually, fortifications. They were pretty advanced, say, for non-Mediterranean standards, but th they weren't really anything that was uh, that stopped the Romans who in fact conquered the most developed area of the Celtic world that is Gaul in, in, in just eight years. Um, um, so the um, so throwing projectiles was seen naturally as one of the most effective ways to take down certain types of wall, the, the strongest type of walls. Mm -hmm. So uh, the same effect of breaching it could be done on a distance with such machineries. This involved uh, therefore uh, uh, a technological improvement of some sort. Um, so this is the moment to which catapults, trebuchet, uh, the so-called petrarie um, in, in Latin and mangonels and the uh, other terms like the chable or the um, calabre in uh, Occitan um, come out, start uh, reappearing. Um, the during the early Middle Ages, actually, um, this form of artillery had not disappeared. Actually, the uh, the most common one was the so-called petraia that we uh, petraria and that we have. Uh, said in Latin, it was actually uh, activated by muscular force, human muscular force. So it was this bar, this leverage that had to throw, it was the arm that had to throw the uh, the stone, because uh, Petraria takes the name from Latin, Petra is uh, stone. Uh, so the, um, the there were like lots of, you know, like Tens of people actually uh, pulling down uh, from one extreme this leverage all together, and, and this launched uh, this stone. And this was actually pretty effective. It was pretty much used in all the great 
um, military of the time, uh, it was actually used everywhere, to be honest. You see, even the, the Vikings had such, um, such uh, siege um, equipment. It was used by the Byzantines, it was used by the Arabs, it was used by the Longobards. Um, it was something uh, pretty much scattered all over. It was um, easy to build, uh, relatively effective, uh, especially and if it was perfectly um, good uh, against the, the average type of fortification that existed at the time. Mm -hmm. So um, that was uh, that was definitely fine. So uh, the um, um, John of Garland, that was a medieval um, philologist and university teacher, uh, he lived um, from the end of the, t of the 12th to the 70s of the, the, the 13th century. He wrote uh, in Latin, um, Parraria. So that would be a um, here you see a perfect example of the variety of the uh, terminology, even the misliteration or or even mistranslation actually parraria est tormentum minus hmm? trabuceta sunt etiam tormenta murorum so here he is making a distinction so he was living in as we've seen in the, in the 13th century so this was the moment to which trebuchet had kicked in as a um, kind of a standard uh, siege uh, um, artillery, at least for the, the larger sizes, and he makes this distinction pretty simple, that is the, the petrary, the, the petraria, I don't know how you want to call it, I, I don't think petrary exists in, la in English, but I think that would be the proper transliteration, it's a uh, lesser uh, engine, uh, tormentum, mm -hmm. Tormentum was the term used to, to define uh, these uh, artillery. And uh, that's where th the same expression tormenting comes from, because the idea was that this artillery wasn't just conceived for actually making a physical damage, but also to hammer psychologically the enemy, mm, so to give uh, a torment to him. While he says the tre trebuchet are instead the... Um, uh, actually he says also uh, these machines for uh, of the walls he used the genitive in here so it, he's basically s uh, saying that the, the petteries were used for lesser mm, fortifications while the trebuchet were used when there were these large massive walls that had to, to uh, take and be taken down so the trebuchet is, is a French name uh, as well um, so, between um, 1180 and 1220, more or less, uh, there was uh, actually the greatest improvement in this um, um, uh, trebuchet uh, ma machineries. Um, these, um, um, I don't know if you have, um, you know, uh, how you know how a trebuchet works. Uh, it's actually pretty simple. There is a a rocker arm. Hmm? So there is a, a weight that you place on uh, the extremity of the leverage and that you uh, keep up with certain um, uh, with certain cords and uh, and uh, and uh, ropes and say and um, and that you let it go. So the the arm throws this uh, thing. And the great technological advancement of this, many people say, oh well, the trebuchet was something rougher compared to to the ancient artillery. Not at all. As a matter of fact, it was not just more effective, but also m way more precise. So uh, this um, this weight system um, allowed basically not to use human muscular force to actually throw the uh, the, um, the the projectile. Of course, you know muscular force had to be used to uh, rise up the the weight. But in this sense, you could use also animals and other stuff, and um, and especially you didn't you, you had to rely on gravity, hmm? not in pulling this down. So with a force that could also vary in time. 
medieval engineers had understood pretty well that given a certain weight uh, uh, the uh, the force that was uh, given to the projectile was greater mm? and since gravity is uh, a vari uh, 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 not a variable but it's a fixed uh, 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 force it's uh, nine if I'm not wrong 9.8 meters um, per uh, on, uh, over a second per second so uh, it, it it's something that remains always the same by calibrating the weight of the um, um, of, of the um, of the counterweight you can um, and and one of the projectile you can actually know you can actually calculate quite precisely where the projectile is gonna hit mm. so trebuchets actually were pretty sophisticated um, machineries um, um, the um, actually um, trebuchet uh, actually also in here there is the problem of defining what it was because initial trebuchet were actually also still uh, using uh, human muscular force mm. um, counterweight fix uh, or mobile counterweights are added later mm, especially in this uh, moment that we've seen across between the 12th and the 13th century so um, if you have uh, it's been calculated if you have a trebuchet of um, manned by 50 people mm, so not actually a few um, but this trebuchet could be be even monstrous things, pretty huge. There were, as a matter of fact, some something uh, something monstrous. So, uh, we have the evidence, for instance, of Edward the Third. I don't remember how it was that, but it was something huge. We're talking about hundreds of um, of of um, uh, of hawks and that were uh, used uh, to to to, tr to to carry that. Um, um, but let's say. Let's say an average of 50 men uh, crew and a um, a counterweight of 10 tons mm, um, could launch um, a stone of 100 150 kilos at 150 meters of distance. Mm. So this is actually massive, especially if you consider that a Roman catapult back in the day could essentially throw it is through a more than 200 meters but a a stone that didn't go past 20 or 30 kilos mm. so what what you can achieve with a trebuchet is by the way the same if you want to throw a, a 30 30 kilos uh, stone you can do it I even at a much longer range than actually <laughs> the, the Roman catapult but a trebuchet you can throw projectiles at hundreds of meters that weight over 100 kilos mm. do you understand the the force of that that's something extraordinary and um, so and and we're talking here uh, we're making a comparison with with the best Roman catapults so the trebuchets were something extremely much more advanced in, in terms of sheer force that could be delivered uh, at a great distance. So there is a beautiful source that is actually the one of uh, Villard de uh, Honnecourt. Uh, he was um, an architect in a let's say uh, designer. He was born in Picardy, probably in the beginnings of the 13th century. So you see, we are always in this French area and uh, around the uh, 12th, 13th century. And he's mostly famous for this album of, um, of not just of sketches actually. Some are some are more complex designs that um, contains I don't know. That, that actually, it's a pretty mixed work. It, it contains um, um, notes about his journeys, um, drawings of, of architecture, um, sculptures, and also of trebuchet. Mm. So um, from these manuscripts and, and other siege weapons, naturally, and from this manuscript, um, it emerges that Villard was not only um, expert in the construction 
of uh, buildings and machines but also that he had traveled as a matter of fact both in France and in other countries of Europe basically um, searching for uh, things to to to, uh, to take note of mm -hmm. so everything that could be useful in these projects to uh, to enrich his work um, and and to, to essentially learn more. This is something about the medieval mind that also we struggle to understand. The medieval mind had an inexhaustible thirst of knowledge. They, the medievals were obsessed by knowing more, knowing more, adding up, adding up to all what they knew, searching for new things. It was um, happening for many reasons. It was mostly a cultural factor. Mm, these people believed that the world was a great symbol that God had created to be for men to be deciphered. Mm. So by knowing, by learning, um, it was not just pure uh, intellectual commitment. It was also um, something greater. It was an ethical challenge in a certain way. And this is something you don't properly find on such a widespread level in other epochs. Mm. In other epochs, the problems were others. It was mostly uh, people were more confident. They only needed they mostly needed methods and categories. The the medievals, b before the knowledge itself, the medievals instead wanted sheer knowledge. They really wanted to drink from the uh, from the spring of it. Um, and this is why we have such extraordinary material. I don't know, maybe one day I will make a video about uh, Villard de Honnecourt uh, album, but it, it's, very, it's very beautiful. And now we... Um, we n we mention him because there is a beautiful depiction of a trebuchet in his uh, in his album. Um, the um, uh, and um, this is an unfortunate. Um, uh, um, uh, there is also another unfortunate uh, thing that uh, he made actually a second drawing about a trebuchet that is lost. But we are lucky enough to have a uh, description that he left uh, about it. So here I have a translation. I could read it in French, but I've got the English text as well. So it basically says, um, if you desire to make the strong engine, which is called a trebuchet, pay attention to these pages. Now, this is interesting because you understand he's kind of giving an advice on how to build it and to, to provide uh, the reader with with valuable practical information mm. so here's saying um, this is the soul so this would be the ore frame of the base just as it rests on the ground in front are seen the two uh, cup stands mm, and the double rope which uh, by which the verge um, uh, is hold uh, down. This is what you can't see in the other page. Um, the the holding down at verge is a series of fair for the counterpoise is um, very heavy. The counterweight is very heavy, for it is a chest full of uh, art, mm, which is two great uh, toises that would be uh, I think twelve feet long. Also, I, I don't fully know if in the case of uh, Vill uh, Villard um, feet, we actually uh, we, we know how much that measured because this will because every place of Europe at the time had different measures. Uh, so he, he says that this uh, chest full of a heart is um, essentially twelve foot long and nine uh, and nine feet long and nine feet broad hmm? and twelve feet deep. So it's a pretty big thing. And consider also the unlocking of the dead end and, uh, and take heat uh, there too, for it must be attached to this tension in front. I don't know here if I pronounce everything correctly, but so he gives us this description and he gives advice on how to build it essentially. Uh, measures and um, and other let's say significant um, knowledge about the structure so the um, there are naturally from 
military history from sources many um, um, many informations about the use of trebuchet uh, for medieval history. Um, what is interesting is also about the appearance of these um, siege machinery for the first time, because there has someone who, for the first time, in, in certain places, uh, built up something like this. Um, the Chronicon San Petrinum, for instance, writes for the year 1212, Otto, come in Thuringia, besieged and reduced to destruction in the castle of the Langrave of Salza, with the Tribras, so written in Latin, called Triboche in German. Mm -hmm. That would be the trebuchet. Um, similarly, the Annales Marbacensis um, describe uh, for the same year, 1212, um, from Zalza he advanced uh, and he besieged Weissensee, uh, which he equally conquered, space, space. There, for the first time, it was used that uh, machine that is vulgarly known uh, with the name of Trebuchet. This this thing of the vulgar, the vernacular uh, language is also very interesting because in Latin, uh, you know, at this time these sources were uh, certain areas of Europe were prevalently writing in Latin, so um, we have naturally vernacular at this time in areas like Germany being written extensively, but we we realized that probably. Um, we, we lost uh, a lot of uh, vernacular terminology of the time uh, that was used to, to define these, uh, these um, siege equipment and, and machineries. So, um, as we've seen, the trebuchet was capable of, long, of, of throwing stones, uh, massive stones at great distances and therefore creating very um, big uh, damage to the uh, fortifications, but trebuchet could be also used uh, notoriously um, in, um, in another fashion that basically consisted in launching within the, um, the walls of the, uh, of the city, of the castle, um, fire projectiles mm, or carcasses of animals that were uh, rotting, essentially, um, in order to uh, spread um, uh, diseases into the um, besieged uh, garrison. So fire was used evidently um, chiefly for burning down what was inside. Uh, we're talking about medieval times, so um, uh, the, the larger cities at this point in the 13th century, say, had um, they were starting to build pretty solid city walls um, and uh, the castles were also pretty solid um, structures made up of, of stone but most of the uh, buildings that were within uh, these fortifications were built in, into flammable uh, material so either timber, hail uh, and other stuff and um, so by throwing fire within the um, within the settlement, you could start a pretty serious uh, f mm, uh, fire within and burning part of it. And this was probably uh, you can understand you can't consume the resources of the besiegers. Uh, you can't try to make also the internal part, if you, especially if you want to <laughs> really destroy the town, um, uh, unbearable to 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 be in. Mm or simply to distract the, um, the, uh, the, the guys who, who are guarding the walls by obliging them to go uh, extinguish that fire. Um, I'm not aware actually of um, fire projectiles thrown by these machineries um, during the same assaults of the, um, of the, uh, of the fortresses which I think it might have been happen, might have happened in a certain way, but preferably 
you know, it was a bit risky probably. And usually this trebuchet fire was something that was definitely integrated in more sophisticated assault tactics, but was really meant to to tear down the enemy walls um, um, before uh, the, the assault. I mean, sometimes the trebuchets were enough, just the trebuchet fire was enough to make the uh, cities um, surrender. Hmm? The castles, especially the smaller fortifications, surrender. Um, so this was something done when the army was preferably most of the times just waiting hmm, for the enemy to and uh, a more dynamic um, use of projectiles was done during the assaults with uh, with crossbows mm -hmm. also because trebuchet fire was not had not a very uh, fast rate as you can imagine so even suppression fire and other stuff like that w would have been pretty ineffective mm -hmm. in in part but um, I, th I don't think you have to uh, whereas w with crossbows instead we know that um, the fire could be the volume of fire could be so actually uh, large that uh, it was impossible to stand on walls under uh, crossbow fire. Um, but um, I, I don't think we should underestimate the um, the psychological effect even of being bombarded by these things uh, even during assault. Mm -hmm. So uh, as the objective of war is actually to break the enemy moral in in in. in in practice, especially from a tactical point of view, but not just from that, it, it's mm, it's really loading the enemy with this pressure, with these worries of seeing these um, stones flying in the air and falling ruinously on on the um, you know on you <laughs> on the city walls. Uh, it's going to be devastating and can't really uh, push you to you know to surrender, especially if you are under assault at that very moment. Um, so there was also a lot of of psychological warfare involved. Mm. Uh, I've read many sources, for instance, in which it's written that trebuchet fire was actually carried out night and day not to make the besieged sleep. Mm. Uh, if you take a person the sleep away, uh, that's a torture that's gonna not going to withstand for, for more than, than some days. So um, there were actually many ways you could use uh, effectively uh, such uh, uh, machineries and also we have seen this chemical warfare that occurred and uh, the um, uh, the idea is um, for instance in 1332 in the siege of um, Schwanau the Strasburgers um, um, the um, uh, the um, that basically uh, were able to make up uh, 60 prisoners mm, to take 60 prisoners and they slaughtered 48 of them and uh, among these uh, there were three uh, carpenters that uh, they placed within um, certain barrels mm, together with uh, rubbish and they basically catapulted them inside the castle of Schwanau. So you can imagine what kind of here basically you're throwing your rubbish into uh, into the enemy castle and you put <laughs> humans within that or human parts within that. So there are actually many examples into medieval history to which um, even pe mm, alive uh, people were catapulted into uh, into uh, uh, against the enemies and it's pretty pretty dark but uh, never underestimate the the effects uh, the psychological effects of this because by the way such things were pretty considered as pretty bad at the time mm. um, I think we are right when we think about the Middle Ages as a moment of um, of great violence and um, of you know of less uh, of a, with a, you know, where when human life actually uh, costed less in in a certain sense, uh, which sounds ugly, but human life does have a price in 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 practice. Um, 
but at the same time, you don't have to think of the medievals as you know uh, morally un uh, insensitive. On the contrary, and therefore, when you see these uh, episodes of extreme violence, even of cruelty in a certain fashion, you have to think that at that time this was really felt, and this is something you can understand. Um, by the fact that uh, medieval sources, on average, really are impressed by this. Mm. So even if these things happened fairly often, considering the kind of endemic warfare was taking place, were still something pretty uh, unusual, mm, and that were regarded as something very, very, very cruel, that in fact was done to break the enemy morale. Not just because you know those people wanted to have fun throwing someone <laughs> in the air with a catapult, but really, um, yeah, sure, th probably someone had fun also through that. But the um, we never have to to underestimate the logics of that. Mm? The medievals were quite morally scrupulous in, in many ways, so even such actions, um, especially when you see. Expert military commanders has always a meaning. It has always something to do with the moral resources and with the expectations that such, um, uh, um, say, the results that such um, actions can produce on the enemy uh, psyche. Mm -hmm. So um, another important, uh, as we've seen, there were many sizes of, of trebuchet and other catapults uh, of sort. Um, now here I don't discuss it but there are also there were also ballistas for instance. It was pretty u common. Actually some of the most common uh, catapults were, were made like that. Mm -hmm. So there was these large crossbows uh, carried with wheels and that were extremely useful by the way in urban warfare. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the, the especially in these narrow uh, medieval streets, you can imagine you place a catapult like that. You can really fence off an enemy enemy attack. A urban warfare was extremely frequent at the time, so mm, there are many examples I can think of. Uh, there is a battle in Florence. There was uh, seemingly one like that, um, by holding the enemy advance in the streets with with a with this catapult. Um, the um, so. Given this variety, we have to think of certain uh, siege weapons that were conceived also for a sort of, not really of sniper fire because that would be excessive, but of precision fire of some of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, so um, sometimes, obviously, there are there were certain episodes that were accidental. Um, trebuchet fire was pretty pretty uh, common during sieges. And there are even eminent um, figures that died because of that. Uh, probably the most famous is the one of Simon de Montfort, mm? the the French crusader that led basically the uh, the invasion of the um, of the, of the French crusader into uh, against the Albigensians. And um, the Al Albigensian crusade was um, um, so a great deal of siege warfare. For the reasons we we remembered, uh, we um, we stated before that was that uh, southern France had lots of castles, a lot of fortresses, and some of them are still there. You can see them; um, they're beautiful. I have seen uh, some of them, uh, really not really the the, the uh, sites of the um, of of, uh, of the main. Um, Albigensian Crusade sieges, but you know, if you go to southern France in places like Carcassonne, or but it's plenty of castles all around, telling the truth. Um, Toulouse, um, mm, also, also um, famously Aigues even th that's something different, it's more of an encircled town. But however, you can really picture if you go there this kind of scenarios. And Simon de Montfort, uh, so there was a lot of siege warfare involved, and Simon Montfort was actually. If I'm not wrong, uh, I don't remember whether he was beheaded by a a trebuchet uh, a stone, but uh, well, no, I don't think we know it. I think it's, he was just hit by a trebuchet stone, and however, it's pretty pretty harsh way to die. And seemingly, so uh, this um, it was not even actually a trebuchet; it was a mm, pe petraria. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, the uh, the infamy of this for the uh, uh, morals of the time is that this pottery had been actioned by uh, women. This were th this was the siege of Toulouse, as a matter of fact. So the women of Toulouse participated to to the siege by uh, manning this, uh, or better, womening <laughs> this um, this uh, machinery. Mm -hmm. uh, women had uh, a great important role into um, siege, uh, into city defenses, mm -hmm. also in castle defenses. This is often an overlooked video. Excuse me, an overlooked uh, topic. To, to I, I was saying that tomorrow probably I will make a video about um, medieval uh, women into uh, how they work. So that it, that was something nice to to uh, to remember. However, and relatively to uh, Simone de Montfort's death, um, this is interesting because actually I don't think that a pottery could be used with such a uh, precision uh, to actually have killed uh, Simone de Montfort on purpose. Mm, that was uh, just a lucky shot, uh, in my opinion. But it's still interesting that such weapons could be so risky at a point, so so dangerous uh, to hit at, at, at great distances without basically uh, uh, being even... Uh, I can't say notice because the hit could be, see f could, could be seen flying, but um that let's say uh, these weapons could hit where you you wouldn't expect essentially so that even um a uh, such an uh, a broader uh, a strategic uh, an important strategic event like the the fall of the crusaders uh dominion on uh on uh, on the albigensian's lands uh, occurred because of a trebuchet fire, you know that after Simon de Montfort died, basically the Crusaders lost almost everything that uh, Simon had built because he had become sort of the lord of the area, and without a uh, head, this domination so soon fell and was just reacquired by the French through through marriage policies afterwards. But just for saying that that such um, weapons could really um, change history uh, uh, not just structurally speaking but uh, like in this case e even by uh, by accident but if that uh, pottery had not uh, been there uh, you know history would have been uh, radically different in this sense I mean radically maybe not but surely for southern France it would have changed uh, a lot and for the rest of European history and world history as well so um, the um, the one of the problems uh, that these trebuchet uh, posed was actually that they had to be uh, they were so dangerous and effective um, for the besieged that a, a lot of effort was put in taking these um, trebuchet uh, down. So. Um, Usually, these these machineries weren't really uh, uh, so precise to actually hit other. They weren't conceived to hit other machineries. Mm -hmm. They were uh, conceived to hit these big squared fortifications. So more or less, knowing that the hit would have gone there. So the, as we've seen before, they were relatively precise for this. Uh, actually, very precise for for the time. But uh, throwing them at other trebuchets would have been kind of useless, and, uh, and and this is a bit what remained also in later in later history with artillery, mm -hmm. uh, even up to Napoleonic times and beyond. I mean, uh, artillery never shot against other artillery because it was considered as wasted um, as wasted shots because they were tough to hit. They were small targets. It was better. In comparison to actually uh, fire at the other um, um, uh, at troops uh, at at naturally also at fortifications, so there were other ways to take out these um, siege um, artillery. So uh, there is an example of uh, I think always during the Albigensian uh, Crusade that in uh, 
uh, at the uh, the siege of um, Castel uh, Nodari. Excuse me a second. Uh, I'm checking one thing. Yeah, this is during the, the same Albigensian Crusade. So this time it was the uh, Occitans that were uh, besieging, and um, this um, this is actually um, um, this is not actually about taking out other trebuchets. So I got mistaken, <laughs> but this is pretty interesting relatively to the ammo of these trebuchets, to the ammunitions, because. It says that the uh, basically this is a source from uh, the uh, I don't remember where this is from. Uh, this is probably ah uh, yeah. This is from the uh, excuse me. I look a little lush. Yeah. This is actually a very important source. It, it is La Chanson de la Croisade, Croisade Albigeoise. Um, so this is was actually a very ancient um, text. It was written um, uh, actually in, th in those same times. Mm -hmm. Um, so I it's very important because it tells us something straight from from the core, uh, 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 let's say, and uh, it's actually uh, in the perfect fashion. On it's modeled on the first uh, on, on on the um, chanson de geste, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's written actually in. Uh, so this is this literary genre, and it's written in uh, langue d'oil. Mm -hmm. And um, it's um, it's actually well now the details maybe are not so important but what it says something very interesting about the trebuchet ammunition it says the besiegers um, uh, rose their trebuchet over a uh, path over a uh, a road but in in no path they could find in any road they could not find stones that basically didn't break out. Uh, with the um, violent, uh, at the violent, um, uh, excuse me a second, I'm sorry for these stops, it's my fault, at the recoil, basically, uh, of the, um, of the fire. Hmm? Obviously there is no fire involved, this is just throwing missile, but you have to think that this trebuchet actually the trebuchet arm really uh, swung these uh, these projectiles pretty pretty fast. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the sheer force of this movement movement was enough to break the uh, the stones. So even find uh, suitable projectiles was uh, actually a serious concern because you you might have taken out this trebuchet. By the way, this is something I I uh, uh, I didn't say that we're often they could be uh, dismantled and uh, disassembled, let's say, and reused, especially the beams for the arm were particularly praised. Usually the other um, the other uh, components were kind of re recreated or maybe also in part were also s uh, stored as well, but uh, they mm, uh, the wall machinery could really be um, uh, disassembled and reused in other time. So it was actually something very, uh, as you can imagine, something very uh, heavy to carry. So also the this added up to the logistical um, um, needs of, of the army. Uh, you needed um, animals to carry that and it could be very uh, very expensive in the first place. So, what a great concern was uh, finding suitable projectiles that evidently were not brought together with the army. Mm. So, as it often happened, you can see this also in Roman times. There were certain soldiers, certain pioneers, engineers that were deputed to um, and craftsmen that were deputed to uh, creating projectiles 
in local. Mm -hmm. uh, this happened also with, with artillery. Mm -hmm. Artillery for a long time, for instance, used stone weapons before cast uh, metal. And um, so this was actually a pretty convenient thing to do uh, evenly because you didn't have to, to take with yourself all the um, projectiles with you that as we've seen by the way were pretty heavy and I'm sure at some point some trebuchet um, traveled in a, in, a, in, a, in an army uh, in a s uh, supply train together with um, certain stones certain projectiles but um, it wasn't really the most economical thing uh, you might have wanna, wanted to do um, so there it goes on, it says uh, they found only three uh, stones that they carried from a from a league of distance. Now this this is interest beca interesting because it tells you even, it stresses the fact that they were these projectiles were found pretty distant. So this implied that was other energy uh, through muscular force that had to take those projectiles uh, from, from from one league away to the trebuchet. Mm -hmm. So this is other cost, other attrition factors during the campaign, etc. So, however, th they found even at least this uh, kind of suitable projectile, and uh, with the first stone, it says they demolished one tower. Uh, here, w I repeat it: we're talking about the siege of Castelnaudary. With the second stone, uh, um, in front of the side of, of everyone, they um, ruined one hole. So the hole was usually uh, a uh, you know a large space, one of the few large spaces in in um, in this castle's um, interiors. So it's usually also a place where you know place of representation, a, res a representance of some sort. Um, and uh, at the third um, throw, this is interesting, th the stone, the third stone therefore, uh, broke down. And if this hadn't happened, this would have costed pretty dearly to the ones of uh, the city. So this is pretty interesting, because it really gives you the dimension of the um, of the forces involved into this, like the um, both in uh, from the uh, you know from from the um, material resistance of these uh, stones that, as we've seen, could break even because of the force that was impressed them to be thrown by the trebuchet, and also for the effects that it could cause. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, only one stone could uh, demolish a tower or a hole, so you you can understand why so much um, uh, you know so many resources were spent to uh, field such uh, siege weaponry because it was so very effective. Um, so. The um, what it surprises you is relatively that even during the 13th and beginning of 14th century, the trebuchet weren't really um, excessively many, even during the larger sieges. Mm -hmm. um, this is actually not something extremely surprising, at least to me, because you know sometimes you find up to a maximum of 20. Mm -hmm but it's rare even that. So the idea is however that a single trebuchet could really throw lots of uh, of projectiles. In uh, in the siege uh, of the, ca the Stirling castle and today's background picture actually is uh, meant to, to depict that, you can uh, see um, here a trebuchet and other here maybe it's not so even there are, there are other smaller uh, catapults so this was a kind of a monster trebuchet mm -hmm. uh, something pretty big uh, 
uh, here it was um, the English king, the English army led by Edward the Third, uh, the uh, Edward the First that was besieging uh, Stirling, and in here there were actually thirteen trebuchet um, involved, uh, deployed. Um, so the the interesting fact about this is that all these trebuchet were named. So there were names like Vicar, Parson, Warwolf, Gloucester, Belfry, Tullemond. Um, so these um, trebuchet were this kind of um, this naming actually emphasizing the fact that they were sort of single pieces. Mm -hmm. So uh, this would happen actually also with the, with the larger cannons in the age of firearms into which we already are in practice uh, because the first uh, firearms were being developed uh, in Europe uh, at this point um, which suggests um, in my opinion the reliance in fact of either or on certain pre um, assemblable weapons as we've seen before so there were probably certain um, trebuchets that were, especially the largest ones, that were disassembled and used for further um, empl employment. Mm -hmm. um, but also the fact that um, th such trebuchets were actually sometimes also created on purpose. Mm -hmm. So that there were something that actually stresses their individual prowess. I mean the idea that these weren't just smaller small things. They were actually big pieces that had in this sense a bit uh, each own its personality um, and that could make uh, uh, and that had a leading role into these uh, into these sieges and um, uh, we're told that at, at, at the 1304 uh, siege of Stirling these uh, 13 trebuchets threw in total 600 uh, stones. So this actually um, shows also how slow this um, rate of fire actually was and this adds ac uh, up to actually the, uh, the chance that these were big pieces and that in this sense were not just difficult to to reload but actually probably it has also a lot to do with the finding the uh, projectiles for it that must have not been something excessively difficult but it was something still pretty costly mm. so every every throw every shot let's say had to be properly calibrated everything had to fi be fixed effectively because um, there's you know a good a good big shot, let's say, uh, was conceived um, as definitely uh, more effective, probably also in psychological terms. You know, one thing is uh, receiving, uh, you know, many small hits that maybe damage the uh, the castle, but um, do not impress you more than much. You can used to get used to that. One thing is to receive a massive blow. So something that really smashes the fortifications uh, and, and, and shattering them, and shocking them in a, at a, in, a, in a massive way, and therefore uh, you know thinking about it like you know we are done, and especially increasing the anxiety as well. Uh, one thing before we said that actually these uh, siege weapons were used also to uh, provi um, prevent people inside. S uh, sometimes were repeated fire to to prevent the besieged to to sleep, to rest. But even waiting for such big things to to throw at you a massive hit, it must be something psychologically devastating mm -hmm. as well. So probably the trebuchets were, uh, and plus the the bigger the trebuchet was actually, and uh, the the longer you could shoot from, this was al also another concern, 
I mean, crossbows now, they didn't have this huge range, but maybe the same castles had trebuchets uh, on the walls on their own. So probably also a big deal of the, uh, relatively to the size of this trebuchet was due to the, um, to the necessity of shooting from a safe distance. Mm -hmm. And consider that usually castles, like in here, were um, placed usually on a higher ground. So those from the castles had, even if they wanted to, if they wanted to use their own trebuchets, they had a pretty substantial advantage, for evident physical reasons, to shoot uh, projectiles uh, longer and also with a greater force, since gravity was uh, adding up to that. In this sense, also parabolic hit made uh, the great, um, the great um, thing of the trebuchet. So these hits weren't probably just focusing on, on a you know, a straight hit. They were al also exploited, trying to throw this projectile up in the air so that it could fall disastrously uh, with a certain with a right angle on the uh, on the enemy. So um, even though we can't imagine many varieties, many also types of trebuchet. Um, and they were built, as we were saying before, also on the basin, um, on the same ground. I mean, the, the ground could vary a big deal, so even trebuchets had to be calibrated and regulated in ways that probably we don't know much about. But even the angle is very important. Mm -hmm. Not all terrains are equal. These things were... And this suggests the fact that certain trebuchet were actually mounted on spots with a certain degree of variety in sizes and in performance because that could really um, add flexibility to the um, to the effectiveness uh, say to the uh, to the employment of this artillery in in various circumstances um, so this was important it's the siege of Stirling was also by the way a very uh, a very important um, show off of of the English mm. because after the um, uh, the Battle of Falkirk in 1298 um, uh, the English now were basically trying to seize all of Scotland and the uh, the uh, the last stronghold of resistance to English rule was actually the Stirling Castle. So the um, um, this uh, siege, by the way, took four years, mm -hmm. and um, and we actually know a, a big deal of how um, about the projectiles that were used um, by these trebuchet. Um, actually, at this point, we are at the beginning of 14th century. We are still in a we are in a actually in a moment in which um, the trebuchet had become pretty standard as a siege weaponry. You find it almost everywhere, practically in in every kind of siege, um, and it had definitely uh, improved and mm, more the, the its use um, had been refined. What we find interestingly is that. Certain trebuchet projectiles were made up of lead balls. Um, this lead had been um, basically taken uh, from the nearby church roofs, mm -hmm. and lead, uh, as you know, is very important because it's um, a material that has a very uh, heavy specific weight. Mm -hmm. So that that's the reason why it was used in warfare, uh, because it has a much higher degree of uh, you know, uh, it, it's it's much more impacting. Uh, it has a greater effect, a greater um, uh, specific uh, uh, weight that can really hit uh, with all that mass in in a single uh, in on a on a narrower surface, and therefore making a a greater uh, damage. So this was meant to actually smash. Uh, Stirling Castle. It was actually a pretty, pretty big castle for those time standards. Greek fire was used, <laughs> as far as we know. So these uh, mixtures of um, certain materials. Now we, we don't exactly know 
um, uh, the uh, it's um, about its uh, how it was made, but it's still interesting because actually we don't know excessively much about um, um, how it was made. There was a, a big deal of uh, the Byzantines were the ones who had held these. Um, um the um uh, let's say of um um they had tried to conceal the the uh, the formula for creating it but at this time in Europe even if it was known up to England up to so um it there isn't probably all this huge mystery behind that also because also the Arabs made extensive use similarly of this and it was known since the ancient age so Sometimes it's more a mystery to us today <laughs> than uh, than the um, uh, than you know, to those people back at the time. So this also saying uh, meaning uh, how uh, technology really um, fared pretty uh, um, pretty um, uh, pretty easily sometimes into uh, this uh, medieval world and that. Uh, Medievals were all but uh, essentially of mm, in need of actually discovering uh, the um, new things because they they more or less already knew how to um, to not how to discover it on its own because this thing of the Greek fire had been actually a great concern for lots of peoples uh, all around the Byzantine Empire wanted to figure out the the mixture. But the um, 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 the this thing was actually created by uh, mixing naphtha and petrol. Um, so um, the uh, there were other uh, the, the there was all a process actually. It, it wasn't much about the, the materials, but rather how it was. Um, eventually uh, worked mm. because, for instance, petroleum is quite difficult to ignite, ignite, and so it has to be uh, separated into different factions somehow, uh, fractions too, and and especially uh, it, it was uh, this mixture was um, an inflammable liquid. It was also mixed with other resins and um, with resins and other materials. Um, Depending also on the use you wanted to do that, the, the Byzantines had certain siphons, so c certain brass force uh, uh, pumps. That, but this uh, at the siege of Stirling, at least it seems there were pretty uh, certain projectiles to, to be thrown. So there were probably certain containers of uh, either I don't know how to, to say that large um, large barrels or or bowls. This fact. Also, of the spheric uh, form is is very important because um, that's not so. You know, sometimes we get the idea that uh, you know is uh, everything was so rough back in the Middle Ages, but actually, even the, the and th that they threw these stones were so um, with different shapes and all. Actually, stones were um, worked, as we said before, to make them suitable for um, trebuchet use and using a spheric projectile uh, it, it obviously gives you so many advantages because it's the perfect form to um, carry out more damage because it doesn't matter which side of the object of the projectile hits the enemy walls it's always being uh, the same uh, force being pressed and the spheric force if is if uh, obviously perfect shapes do not exist into nature um, geometrical shapes uh, but if if you have a, a spheric projectile, more or less, uh, the the theory is that only a little part of the projectile is actually smashing through the uh, initially to the uh, wall, so that all the force of the projectile is uh, transferred into that tiny part. So it creates a very heavy damage in that section and can open up, uh, you know, can cause a, a, a pretty um, serious fracture to to the structure mm, and that's why um the um that's why also the lead and all 
So Greek fire at this point, especially as a uh, to a heavily such a heavily fortified castle like the one of Serling, was probably something more of a of a show off, like like saying you know I'm gonna scare <laughs> the hell out of you with this. Uh, and telling the truth, we also know because the Greek fire had also probably some salt pattern into it. I mean, the, 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 the mixtures of the, in the composition could vary, and uh, it, it might be that these um, projectiles already this time were already explosive in some fashion, which is actually something normal because, especially the Venetians and the Mamluks that were ahead into this technology at the time, uh, were already using. Um, explosive projectiles as soon as they were using firearms so we can imagine that in here something of that was already understood even uh, in uh, in England as perfectly plausible and that as such projectiles in this sense even with Greek fire could cause just more than you know this flammable liquid but also a sort of a of ex of deflagration mm. and uh, sensibly uh, damage the enemy walls, and and in fact, Edward the First had sulfur and saltpeter uh, actually um, uh, brought from England, supposedly from for the siege of Stirling. Mm. So this is also interesting because it tells that that was a that was a a precise uh, intention. Mm. Uh, and that probably had also a lot of um, propagandistic uh, meaning. Mm -hmm. So a big show off. The last Scottish resi resistance, that's what you really want to take down uh, with, uh, with a mighty <laughs> spectacle, let's say. Um, the, um, the especially the biggest of these uh, trebuchet uh, was the war wolf. Uh, and uh, it seems that Edward actually ordered um, his chief engineer, Master James of St. George, to uh, to build this monster. That is uh, the one you can hear, uh, you can see here. And eventually, Stirling Castle fell. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Stirling Castle was uh, held only by thirty uh, people, so uh, quite small garrison. That uh, that tells you, by the way, how easy it was. Um, before the uh, creation of this um, of these um, missile weapons um, of this siege artillery to hold uh, a, a fortress, mm -hmm. even if we're a few people, because there were really few ways you can you could make it true, uh, really. And um, so we have evidence of what else can we say now? Well, whatever. Um, so here, uh, passing going on. The um, always talking about England, this thing of uh, of worked projectiles. That is, uh, is something um, that d the English government took care of since 1244, seemingly. Mm -hmm. So England at this time was one of the most in spite of now, yeah, that there had been the Magna Carta and etc. But its administrative reforms had actually, uh, excuse me, its administrative organization was pretty advanced. It was still a pretty centralized uh, uh, kingdom. Uh, not that the Magna Carta actually decentralized it, but I mean, here we're talking about monarchic power. Mm -hmm. So there was a very big deal of centralization at the time and England was uh, one of the most centralized kingdoms and here already uh, the English government in, in the 40s or 13th century is taking care of the uh, the creation of large quantities of trebuchet uh, projectiles in spheric form mm -hmm. so this actually um, shows uh, something different from what I was telling you before that is that such projectiles were actually um, carried out together with the army mm -hmm. so they weren't built just um, I during the uh, the campaign naturally this would be it, it was probably a mixed system because but considering especially these greater trebuchet probably um, even finding a, um, a suitable 
uh, projectile was something difficult and especially these spheric projectiles were evenly the best and um, this evenly saved time mm, even if probably added uh, as we were saying before traditional factors relatively to carrying these uh, materials there together with you that was fine it was still convenient and this probably adds up to the to the dynamism um, of the use of trebuchet because um, basically by carrying those projectiles with you it means that they are immediately available for firing at an enemy castle so you don't have to wait days and days before this uh, you know the engineers go around and take these projectiles and they rework them mm -hmm. that can be done uh, that is actually and, and this is where why centralization was important also for that thing I was telling you before that this new kind of siege warfare with trebuchet etc really favor decentralization of national monarchies mm -hmm. um, and, and this is probably why instead in the um, Chanson de la Croisade Albigeoise you have um, in a fragmented area of Europe like southern France was instead you don't have this form of organization mm -hmm. you find just uh, they had the trebuchets but they had to find the projectiles along the road uh, substantially so these were also partly the advantages of having a centralized kingdom uh, like in England a relatively centralized kingdom at, at least um, more than the others uh, so um, on June the 6th 1296 always Edward the first uh, reached uh, with his army in front of Holyrood in, in, in the uh, it's, it's, it's close to, to Edinburgh and I here he installed three uh, machines that in three days threw 158 large stones this is interesting it means just let's make a brief uh, calculation w these are three uh, trebuchets okay uh, so this means that every day every trebuchet threw 17 and a half uh, stones mm -hmm. so it means all roughly one every hour and and, and a quarter mm -hmm. that is interesting and it is actually pretty fast considering probably uh, the kind of so this tells actually um, how these trebuchets were integrated into the uh, uh, well integrated into the uh, armed forces by this time also in organization organizational terms so um, other ways uh, as we said at the beginning uh, that were uh, appreciated let's say uh, to to make um, walls fall was the um, digging uh, beneath the uh, walls and uh, tunneling and therefore making collapse uh, this um, the structure this could be achieved actually in many ways um, there were also pretty ingenious ones sometimes like burning up uh, a crowd of pigs uh, while under the tunnel so maybe so probably I'm creating this uh, chemical reaction of uh, of um, of combustion that would have made the uh, the atmospheric pressure in the tunnels to um, basically uh, increase sensibly and shaking the wall uh, structure making the uh, the castles fall this was actually uh, done carried out uh, at a certain point in also also in England in England in here and I, I even though I don't remember which uh, siege uh, it was I can uh, uh, it was uh, uh, flaming pigs had actually existed for other purposes uh, in uh, also since the ancient world uh, but I can't find it but this was the si I don't remember what it was the siege of uh, let me look of 
was the Siege of Rochester? Might be. Yeah, it was the Siege of Rochester Castle. Yeah, I think it was the one of... Uh, Twelve fifteen siege of Rochester. It should be. Whatever, but uh, just for saying that these were um, were actually pretty. Um, there were many ingenious ways to 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 actually make um, cows. So you you understand I even the dynamism of this, and there were also many other ways to counter tunneling, or at least to spot it, and to be prepared to meet the enemy. So. Uh, a big deal of this was also achieved by uh, of, of storming uh, fortresses was uh, taking them by surprise. Sometimes this um, idea, or, or maybe be being um, also uh, treason, was a pretty effective way to make it to to be um, to have an, an agreement with some people who lived beneath uh, within the city uh, w within the walls and letting a you know, uh, passage opened and pouring in, uh, and then uh, st uh, mm, uh, under cover, let's say, and uh, and then uh, fighting I in the streets. Or and and there is a lot. I, I would like to tell a lot about this, but this is not specifically m today's topic. And I'm I'm so angry actually that I can't find the the proper words in English, and I'm really an idiot. Um, but let's say that there were also many other ways to make it. Uh, uh, naturally, a big deal of taking the um, the um, castles uh, uh, by surprise was also um, um, exploiting certain atmospheric conditions. Uh, this is pretty um, strange. Usually, um, with the um, uh, this happened by uh, hammering or um, um, uh, hitting with uh, picks, um, with pickaxes, the posterns. This is what I wanted to say of a certain uh, uh, of the castles, because by the way, these castles you have to imagine them to be uh, full of also of certain hidden passages or certain blind spots as well. Um, so sometimes it was possible to pour in. Uh, I've read certain sources of uh, this uh, pickaxing of, uh, of posterns during uh, in, in, uh, at night and during um, uh, thunderstorms, so that the uh, the uh, the sound would have not of the hammering would have not been heard. Um, actually, these uh, coop of of castles was was achieved especially during the uh, winter, because um, it was not the uh, it was unexpected in many ways um, because during winter usually military operations didn't didn't take place uh, or at least it wasn't so easy to do that but it was enough to take castles as we've seen they had usually um, small garrisons just to pour in wi with a few troops with a few good um, elite troops and storm in it and um, and and also in winter this was done. Uh, to uh, exploit, in this sense, also the uh, the darkness, mm -hmm. the times of, of darkness before the sun rose again. Because also a big deal in here is, you know, you don't have uh, uh, you don't have bengalas or <laughs> or infrareds, uh, googles. Uh, so sometimes it was difficult, especially at night, to really understand w which was the entity of the enemy that was attacking you. Um, and it was, was actually, a, and that's why psychological warfare is so important because sometimes you could really, all these, um, um, uh, um, these actions were usually happening as sort of uh, um, surprise events, like uh, even from an insulting way, you know. There was a lot of shame attached to defeats at this time, especially when they were carried out by. Uh, uh, where they were coming uh, because of the uh, um, the unconcerned n nature of those who had been tricked practically, so those who had uh, lowered gu lowered uh, the guard, uh, and that um, and this is how really war is fought, by the way, because 
war is not really just about open pitch uh, I mean open field battles and all um, it's really mostly about this about taking castles taking armor posts especially in this medieval um, warfare that was really about that even a single castle could owning uh, and taking by su and seizing a castle could really make the strategic e equilibrium shift consist considerably it took a month if not years actually to have the good opportunity once again to, to retake that castle and it required a lot of effort so um, that's why a lot of um, inventive and application was put in taking these castles and the trebuchets were the radical <laughs> way to make it like but not always trebuchets could could do that for instance um, uh, the 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 castle of Chateau Gaillard famously there was this uh, uh, actually it means already by the name the strong castle mm -hmm. uh, of that um, is present in no uh, that was built in Normandy by uh, uh, built in Normandy actually as a bulwark for uh, for English Normandy to uh, from to, s to halt the, the the French invasions and eventually uh, and it was captured by Philip the Philip the Second of France after a very long siege in 1204, which in fact implied basically the um, also this uh, extensive work of tunneling mm, to take it because it was on this rock spur it was extremely difficult uh, it, was, it had very massive walls by the way trebuchets were not always um, effective let's say you have to consider that especially t um, these military operations had a great cost mm. here we are in the middle ages armies usually lasted for a few months at the longest and it was already a problem in terms of not just of economical cost mm. think of all the problems also of keeping a camp with thousands of people all the hygiene uh, problems the epidemics that could spread and all but also the fact that your feudatories or your subjects would have not been to stay there longer than they than they wanted there was all a political bargaining for making stay feudal contingents uh, during a siege for, for a prolonged time so even taking a siege uh, at this point uh, uh, taking a castle could could last too long for the will of the besiegers to remain or the interests of the besiegers to 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 remain obviously the monarchs were pretty much concerned about this because their goal was usually greater than the one of their feudatories uh, and they they thought in in larger terms so taking these castles as we've seen sometimes equated like to take a whole region because of how um, effective they were in their strategic function um, so if you don't have you know if the terrain is bad so you don't have the right angle or you don't have many trebuchet or or the or the castles walls are very massive so that you can't hit a dam with a trebuchet but maybe the distance is too great um, or the height is too great uh, so you can't always make an effective damage especially on Chateau Gaillard and this rock spore was, um, was pretty uh, pretty high massive walls so even the trebuchet could hit probably but not having this uh, terrible effect we've seen that the rate of fire was usually uh, slow there weren't so many trebuchet at one time uh, so these hits uh, could not be effective at least um, it, it would have taken too long for me for the army to remain to take down the enemy walls with trebuchet mm -hmm. so creating castles over very uh, impervious um, terrain was actually a pretty good way to make that castle impregnable Chateau was one of them and the French finally took it uh, after a lot of, of uh, you know of, of struggle and uh, the um, the idea is um, the so this by the way controlled the Seine River so it, it was a very important uh, 
center so uh, I don't remember wh where I was going with this but um, the point is uh, that oh yeah that there are certain castles that can't be taken even with trebuchet mm, it's just the location that makes them impregnable sometimes even though uh, a too impregnable position sometimes is also you know you can pass by that you know uh, from there you can be well defended but you might not have a reach or over the surrounding communications so until it's not a mountain pass or a river pass you know it's uh, I it's mostly a problem because if you have to left it um, if you have to leave it behind mm, sometimes but whatever this uh, has to do just for saying that sometimes it's more the political situation that uh, goes past the strategical problems than the other mm. depends who owns that castle what interests the, uh, he has mm. so this is also how uh, the whole thing uh, worked so anyhow if you finally managed to breach into the enemy walls you have to take out a uh, an assault so also here it would be a lot to tell uh, usually assaults um, sometimes um, it was enough to make very narrow breaches into the walls to make um, men and horses pass mm, inside. Uh, it's like with the posterns before we're talking about. It was enough just to enter the castle mm, and uh, and then making people pouring in. So, um, for instance, during uh, sometimes even um, uh, aside from breaches, uh, assaults could be obviously led with uh, ladders. Mm -hmm. For instance, in the first siege of Constantinople, Villehard tells us that the, the first, um, let's say, the attempt made by the, the first attempt by certain Frankish uh, knights to, um, in, in a certain, at a s in a certain point of the Theodosian walls. Mm -hmm. And he says they uh, these uh, the Crusaders in the 1204 uh, siege of Constantinople they rose um, um, uh, close to a barbican. So a barbican would be uh, essentially a um, a fortified outpost of gateway. Uh, it's normally made for the defense of a city or a castle. Uh, or uh, or a tower located over a gate or a bridge that has this uh, chiefly defensive purpose. At least it was born as a as a um, for a military function. Then eventually it also evolved into a sort of aesthetical thing. Especially during Renaissance, there were still these uh, exterior elements being replicated, but they didn't have the um, the same function. Uh, anymore especially with development of artillery etc so um, what what Villard one says in the the Crusaders rose two ladders next to a barbican uh, next to the sea this was the Bosphorus and the wall so they they, they start cli uh, climbing and, and the wall was uh, very crowded by uh, English uh, and Danish. The assaults were strong, uh, say, virile and, and hard, uh, and uh, that would be manly and hard. And over the walls climbed um, with great strength two knights and two surgeons, and they conquered the wall before the others. On the wall climbed well 15 men and they fought um, uh, into the melee with axes and swords. And those inside who um, um, were, um, you know, re, uh, let's say reconforted because they threw them out with great shame and, uh, and by losing only two. So this is interesting because this is a typical assault now, aside from the exceptional um, uh, circumstance of the siege of Constantinople. But by the way, Constantinople at the time uh, had still the Theod uh, had the Theodosian walls that were still at the time a pretty formidable, uh, uh, made of the city one of the best defended in Europe, 
and those were built in <laughs> uh, in the late antique times that uh, yeah they had been restructured in part but essentially that uh, it was the same structure so um, this however makes for a uh, this quote makes for a regular a ladder uh, assault on, on the walls with ladders w what is interesting here says the um, the crusaders were fighting with axes and swords mm. so these are kind of weapons that you wa you want to really use into uh, into hand to hand combat over a wall where there is a few space so you can't bring a lance effectively or at least you're better off with it with this effectively especially with axes these pretty smashing weapons to to knock out the enemy face to face uh, in in uh, hand to hand combat but the crusaders are overthrown then eventually constantinople would have been taken by two knights one venetian and one frenchman uh, they um, those were the first that i think rose to the walls and eventually the others fall so it was relatively and and this first assault crusade uh, crusader assault was uh, repelled uh, also with a few losses from the uh, the defenders side um, so this is interesting because it really shows uh, how desperate sometimes it was to climb uh, to uh, to over these walls and uh, how ruinous it could bo uh, could really be there was a siege I don't remember where I, f I think it was against the Normans in uh, in Comnenian times some sometimes into which were actually other Norman mercenaries into the um, into the Byzantine armies that climbed over this castle, and it was ruinous because the guys from from the walls kind of uh, shattered their um, the the attackers' ladders, and they made them fall and ruin on over the rocks uh, that were uh, below there. So it's. Uh, these were pretty risky things to do, and, and that's why you needed cover fire, crossbows, uh, chiefly, etc. Because uh, it, it, it's very easy for someone who is on the top of the walls to just uh, push you back in some way. And uh, and you need, by the way, kind of assault troops to, to perform. That's not, not just the regular, I don't know, uh, feudal levies that are you know militias and stuff like that are gonna be butchered you need actually knights people covered in armor that uh, can withstand the heavier blows of of those who, who are uh, above and so you can imagine all the uh, uh, the worst thing like boiling oil um, that were thrown at the uh, besiegers and all this stuff you know that but we're not gonna discuss this and um, all these measures, in, in a way or in another, were actually also known um, from from some time actually in Europe, especially from the mid of the 12th century. It's the moment to which really Western warfare starts to 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 grow substantially different from the one that it had been. I can say before, because also here there's a very progressive. Uh, evolution and um, uh, for instance the, the mangonels so these other uh, um, weapons that are used for throwing uh, stones uh, and that works um, also in here uh, it's uh, tra it would be a traction trebuchet mm -hmm. so it's it's something that involves also the um, the torsion mechanism, mm, differently from the counterweight of the trebuchets, is something you um, actually it can be manned also in here by muscular force as well. So also just like for the trebuchet, they um, they had a similar evolution. And in the 885 siege of Paris uh, by the Normans, mm, um, there are um, such uh, weapons actually already uh, uh, witnessed in in Viking use, by the way. 
So even the Vikings that, you know, sometimes we say, oh, these were more primitive peoples and all, but they, they kind of used siege warfare as well, especially when they began eventually to, at this time, to, to deal also with more fortified centers, like the one of the, uh, of the Franks, they, they soon adapted to the, so it's not really a matter of technological backwardness, it's really what kind of need you, you, you have. You know, in Scandinavia there weren't castles at the time, at least not as uh, as uh, as large as they were starting to form in Europe. So it's obvious that the Vikings were were less versed for for um, for siege warfare. But as soon as they find the, the difficulty, they they try to to overcome it. And the um, uh, the uh, this is the the uh, the source from the abbot of uh, Saint Germain de Pré that wrote about the the siege, the Viking siege of Paris, and he says uh, about the Viking mangonels with beams uh, with paired beams of equal length, they built what is um, vulgarly called the mangonels, so machines that throw stone, immense stones that go to smash the uh, uh, the modest galleries of the uh, barbarian race. So, um, wh what he's saying here is actually even something more, I, I, I'm not sure, this is, I'm reading this in translation so I don't really know whether what it really meant, but um, it's uh, it's probably stating here that the uh, the Vikings were using certain um, um, certain uh, machinery that was um, more advanced. I mean, it was you know fitting essentially for destroying the the fortifications that these Scandinavians had in their own lands mm -hmm. and that maybe at the now at the siege of Paris w w wasn't s as effective like a against the these other scan smaller sc Scandinavian settlements the Vikings were used to but it's still remarkable however that here it says that they this uh, machinery threw uh, immense stones so something big so it tells you that the Vikings def definitely also were used to to operate such weaponry, uh, even in, in their homeland, in part. Um, so, in, in fact, all this prejudice that the, um, you know, the, the, the siege equipment was not, especially these um, throwing weapons were practically not used, is actually, um, uh, during the early Middle Ages, is um it's not really um it's not really true i don't think personally that um siege machinery was that rare in the early middle ages i mean yeah it was used occasionally because there were just a few occasions to besiege large cities and all but when the the need was there this was done obviously as we've seen the these were mangonels or petteries so nothing extremely complex but still capable of doing some damage and we don't have to think that magically you know with the end of the ancient world nobody used any kind of, of throwing uh, of stone throwers uh, out there so but it's definitely between the 12th and 13th century as we have seen that these especially technical perfectionments rather than um, uh, you know sudden inventions actually allowed a, a more rapid and more precise uh, fire uh, and definitely also the use of heavier projectiles and the same goes along with uh, other the rest of military engineering so tunneling field fortifications other fortresses of sort castles m castle engineering and stuff like that so um, I think this is enough for today and um, what else can I say about this yeah I, I think the last point was was important I mean it's not that by the 12th century trebuchet arrives in Europe and nobody had ever seen anything um, comparable 
stone throwers were already there used yeah they were smaller they were more rare the trebuchet were something amazing hmm. yeah nobody had really seen those before in those generations naturally um, also because these weaponries by the way in Europe have never been used uh, but let's say that with the contacts with the Byzantines and the and the Arabs and all the Westerners had always had a grasp that such uh, machinery existed so we don't have to be surprised about it we don't have to be to think as if these were a bunch of in uncivilized barbarians that uh, all of a sudden get civilized with the books of someone else no this is not really it it was a very steady progress and um, and especially it was a progress uh, whose logics you have really to understand in itself you know uh, once again in order to besiege a moat you don't need sophisticated <laughs> torsion engines you don't need catapults you just either take them for uh, for anger or you uh, maybe assault them so um, it's a matter of convenience mm -hmm. and and that's how really it's always about the relation cost benefits nothing more nothing less most of the times there, there might be certain cultural factors that mm, have to do but uh, with uh, lesser greater employment of such weapons but those are virtually uh, ininfluent mm. as uh, it's really what concerns the structure that makes the difference mm. and even the evolution of uh, siege machinery um, and uh, in this sense evolves pretty um, pretty smoothly mm. even with firearms firearms didn't revolution warfare at all this is also another prejudice you know this idea that technology is is, is something that arrives in a full package that you apply in s somewhere and that somewhere magically develops no it's not like that technology is always there it's always developed continuously by the same people and it progresses with the needs of the people hmm? so that's it and um, so um, for now I just hope that you enjoyed this video uh, if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming uh, videos and for now i thank you uh, heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time bye